All right, well, well, let's get started here. I'd like to welcome everyone, especially like to welcome um, Dr. Robert Parent. Um, as I recently learned, she is a, a hometown girl here from, from Logan and her husband is from Paradise here in Cache Valley. And uh, she's a USU alum, has several degrees from our uh, university. So we're grateful to have her especially. Um, I'd like to welcome the 37 now participants that we have. Um, to this uh, this breakout session. So uh, let me introduce Robert and uh, Robin and we'll get going here. So Robin Parent is an, an assistant director of STEM education at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. Her primary role is project manager for the Aspire Alliance funded by the National Science Foundation aimed at diversifying the nation's STEM college educators and expanding the use of inclusive practices. In this role, Dr. Parent supports the Alliance director and leadership, as well as the backbone of the organization. The Alliance includes over 40 active members engaged through three change initiatives who engage over 50 institutions and hundreds of faculty, staff, and administrators across the country. And we are very excited to hear what she has to say, and I will turn the time over to Robin, so. Thanks so much, Ted. I am super excited to be here with all of you today. Um, I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Villanova's uh, keynote and was you know, tickled to see the different ways that um, my presentation connects with some of the things she said. And in fact, she jogged me to go back into my presentation and make a few key changes because it just, it connected so well. Um, I should first put as a caveat that I was originally going to um, be coming to Logan in March to do a much longer workshop about threshold concepts and inclusive teaching at USU, which I was so excited about. And then of course, COVID happened and I, that didn't, I didn't get to come and visit. So um, USU was really wonderful in uh, giving me the opportunity to have this session to share a little bit about you and for me to give back to uh, USU. Um, however, 45 minutes is about time to scratch the surface of, of the kinds of things that threshold concepts can do for you in your coursework and curriculum and probably just give you more questions than I can probably answer. So I wanna put that out there at the beginning that I'm not going to be giving any holy grails or golden tickets, but I'm hoping that maybe this will spark some interest in um, possible learning communities or areas of interest at in which I would be happy to provide additional resources for um, as you move forward. So with that, I am going to relearn how to switch the slides. There we go. Okay, <laughs> and start with a little bit of an introduction about what inclusive faculty do. You've been learning a little bit about that earlier. You probably know a lot from the work that you do in your own spaces, but I really like the way that Considine et al. talks about this in the ways that um, they identify social identities and systems. So they say that instructors creating inclusive classrooms adopt a definition of diversity that considers multiple social identities. And social identities are a pretty important component of some of the things I will talk about today. These social identities are um, about themselves, so us as faculty and instructors, but also um, the social identities of the students. And they examine how identities are constructed. And by doing that examination, also critically reflecting upon our own subjectivity as educators. How do we know what we know and teach what we teach? And also considering the systemic issues in our society, in our institutions, in our teaching practices that affect the way students learn and how they learn, both positively and negatively. So keeping those things in mind, um, let's take a look at a couple of things. I'm going to introduce a framework and then also a concept because we get to put these things in, in these big umbrellas. The first is this Aspire Inclusive Faculty Framework. And this framework is something that I work with on a daily basis through the Aspire Alliance. It was developed through our national change team that works with faculty development in the STEM disciplines across the country. And I will put a plug in here that our workshops are usually free 
that are virtually right now. So at the end, I'll make sure that you have a link so that you can utilize any of these resources and tools and engage in workshops as you might moving forward. But the inclusive faculty framework came out of our developmental grant through NSF that led into our alliance and the research in the developmental grant pointed out that when working in inclusive practices in faculty roles. So thinking about all the different roles a faculty person or staff person plays at an institution, we found that there were three core domains, identity, intercultural, and relational. And that the skills that are foundational in each of these domains cut across all of the different roles that faculty might in, inhabit in their careers. And that by working on the focus of these domains and these skills, that we can transfer those skills across these different roles. So that what they do then is allow us to then impact our inclusive practices in the different spaces, whether we're teaching, we're advising, we're mentoring in research settings, we're in leadership roles, or we're engaging in our, with our colleagues, that these skills transfer across those spaces and that they help us really work to build inclusive spaces, both within our departments, but also our institution. That is the big umbrella. It kind of leads to the behaviors that we exhibit, the skills that we try to impart in the spaces that we work. A smaller piece of that are the concepts about those inclusive practices that we might be able to utilize in our curriculum design. So threshold concepts, um, term that came up from Meyer and Land, so it's been around for a while since the 1990s, and it was developed in as a concept in economics, and since then has been applied to disciplines, every kind of discipline under the sun. And what we see is that threshold concepts are considered to be a portal that once that concept or that idea within the curriculum is understood, it can't be unlearned. It's about crossing that threshold and that opens the door to what comes next. We think about this in learning theory as like a scaffolding of learning, right? You must learn this before you can do that. And that mastery helps us with the building blocks of our disciplines and the kind of work that we're doing. So, when we think about a concept or a threshold concept, something that is so pivotal in our disciplines and in our curriculum, we think of them as the jewels of that curriculum. And we collect those jewels as we go along. I'm sure our students or when we were novice learners in the spaces, we may not have thought of them as jewels and we probably thought of them as big mountains and that we had to climb and move over. But once you figure it out, it becomes this piece that you have to collect and that you keep with you. They're transformative. So that once you understand them and once you are mastering that concept, it transforms your thinking about that space and allows you to move on. They're irreversible. You cannot unlearn it. Once learned, it's there. An example of this is I teach uh, women and gender studies courses and I had to, it was actually at Utah State I was teaching an intro to women and gender studies course and it had been in the spring and we had just been talking about gender representation in the media. Super Bowl had just taken place and I had had students analyzing Super Bowl um, commercials looking at gender representation. And end of the week, they turned in their reflective papers and I had a student come up to me and said, you know, since I, since I have been thinking about this, I see gender roles in media everywhere. I see them on billboards, I hear it on in radio, I see it in commercials, I see it in movies, I see it in magazines, I see it everywhere and I can't unsee it. This is the kind of irreversible. For this student, I, they weren't sure that that was a good thing and, and that's part of learning. It's a, it can be a little uncomfortable to suddenly have that lens be clear and not fogged. They're also integrative that once learned, we can begin to see the connections and we can integrate those pieces into other parts of our learning so that once a concept has been completely realized and mastered, they begins to see those connections to other courses that they're taking, past work that they have done, the lab that they're going to be doing in, in connection with what they're learning in the classroom or the internship 
or the position that they might be applying for. So I was talking about the student who was feeling a little uncomfortable about recognizing and realizing a threshold concept in a women and gender studies course. And that's what we call liminality. It's this betwixt and between state. It's this beginning to understand that there's, that there's something that you're learning and it's tickling and it's, it's there and it's part of, part of the learning process, but not having completely moved through that threshold door at the end. And that space can manifest itself in different ways for students and for ourselves as we continue learning. So I like to think about what does it look like when students encounter threshold concepts. And we can think about it kind of in that progression. Students who are really struggling might represent what we might see as indicators that they're struggling in that space are poor grades. We might see a um, really poor score on a quiz or only a few sentences written in a post that was supposed to be two paragraphs or not good analysis in a response to something just not not theirs real struggling pieces the or disengagement with class and content so not coming to class not coming to class for a series of classes um that kind of disengage not participating in group work um not turning in labs those kinds of things or pushing back in discussion so Again, I'm going to draw upon an experience in a uh, women and gender studies class from when I was at Cal Poly. I was working with an engineering faculty member and we were talking about gender in the sciences and um, the importance of ensuring that we uh, diversify the curriculum, especially in engineering and what does that look like and how do we intersect those spaces together. And there was a student who was giving some, some pushback in that, well, engineering is a white space. White men in the United States do engineering and you look in a textbook and that's who you see. So the, that's the pinnacle of what it was. And there was this pushback there because there was an uncomfortability of, be, of being able to conceptualize outside of what was the learned experience. And that can be just, I'm not ready to make it into that space and that pushback. Yes, I see from Spencer that in the, um, in the chat, hashtag struggling. I had a student act out in anger, picking a fight with others. Absolutely, we can see this in discussions with each other, not just with a faculty and a student perspective as well. The um, where does discussion break down in anger, in fear, in, um, and that can be in outbursts in those spaces or really retracting into oneself. And in an inclusive space, that can be, this can be especially problematic for students who are not as engaged in it for various reasons. And so we might see it manifest itself in very different ways. This would be like the accessibility of the learning issues that uh, Dr. Villanova was talking about this morning. Then we have the grappling space. This is where they're, they've moved past the super uncomfortability space, but they're practicing. They're practicing language. They're practicing pieces of the concepts. They're trying to, to do some things, but it's very rote. And we see a lot of mimicking. If you think about students who, um, I probably fell into this category. Um, and luckily my uh, dissertation co-chairs are, co are both teaching the other sessions right now, so they can't verify everything. But um, I probably practiced language of my discipline. And I probably used big words not appropriately in certain spaces, but I was trying them out because I'd been reading them, I'd been hearing them, and I was moving into the context and the identity of what my discipline was and is. And we might see that from our students, that they're using those words in those spaces, but it's not quite understood about what they're doing. But it's in that sort of taking two or three steps forward in liminality and maybe one or two steps back. And then the last part is that mastery. What does it look like when a student masters a concept? And this is when we start to see, you know, the upper end of the Bloom's taxonomy, that application piece, where they're able to transfer that concept, where they're able to uh, connect and um, make connections where 
oh, I learned this in that class yesterday, and that connects with this theory and this idea today, and I'm able to then think about, I can kind of guess, tomorrow we're going to do X, Y, and Z. The picture just sort of becomes even bigger on what they might be able to do, and then they're ready to kind of begin engaging in whatever that next concept is that leads to the next building block of their understanding. So how do we use threshold concepts as a diagnostic tool? And um, I usually start with questions. And I did a year, see, this is why I say 45 minutes is the just scratching the surface. I did a year long learning community with faculty at Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. And we started with this defining threshold concepts. We started then looking at it within our disciplines. And we spent a year really digging into individual curriculums and programs and disciplines. But we start with, where do our students usually struggle in courses? Can we think about a class that we taught last semester? Where was the struggle? Where particularly in the cur curriculum and with what concepts? And why do they struggle more? And some of these things might be intersecting if we take into consideration COVID, we take online learning, hybrid learning, the things that are happening in their um, social lives and communities, things that are happening in our lives, we begin to see some intersections of where these threshold concepts become even more sticky or troublesome. So we, can we pinpoint those? Another way to look at it is, are, can you identify where your drop, fail, and withdraw rates are in courses? This is really um, important for courses that we call gateway courses. They might often be larger lectures. They usually have multiple different lab sections. Um, they fall in sequences and they don't have to be large. It can be English 1010 moving to English 2010. There, there's a transition space there. Can you identify where those troubled spots are? And then, and this is a big one that reflects on our own sort of identities and expectations of students is, have you ever thought or had a conversation with colleagues where you said, students should have learned X, Y, and Z in this class, and they can't do it in my class. That's a great indicator of where a threshold concept might be located, is when you start having these types of questions, when your assumptions of what students should be able to do at a certain point in your curriculum, and they're not being met. So that begins to identify and pinpoint the spot. What it doesn't do is begin identifying the the reasons. And this is where we start to draw more upon that framework that I was talking about, the inclusive faculty framework. And we begin thinking about identities. And we think about who we are a learner as learners. When did we start learning this? Who did we learn it from? What was that process? The problem with this is that can be kind of hard because we've passed through that threshold. We get it. It's hard to reflect back on it. Um, because we're like, well, if I've never always known this, I've, I've done this. It's just, this happens and this happens. So that diagnostic is important, but it's not as good as being able to think about where our students are now. How is their experience in education different? How is it different historically? And how is it different immediately? And does that impact the way that they're learning in this particular space? Are we teaching at a particular way that normalizes the education. This is drawing again on Dr. Villanova's um, talk this morning. Do we normalize a concept? And have we normalized it in such a way that we're, we're actually excluding different types of learners and identities from understanding that particular type of concept because of the way we're presenting the material? And can we interrogate that in a way that begins to open up that space and allow us to design multiple ways of achieving that uh, threshold concept or explain it in different ways or what sort of remedial materials do we have to have available. It can also mean having great conversations with who teaches the course before you. Um, in our year-long learning community that we instigated, one of the things that we really advocated for was if you teach a course that fits within a program sequence, to really get to know who teaches the course before you and who teaches the course after you so that you're designing appropriately and 
being sure to try and connect. This is where some of that good team teaching comes in and inviting the faculty that taught the class. This is, works especially well if you're in a small department and all of your students in your class took it from this other person the semester or the year before. Can you invite that person back in and work with them to deliver a lesson? And this just provides a good continuity and alignment across not only your, your course and your content, but also your students' learning experiences. It allows you to kind of grow together. So making inclusive changes. Once you're identifying the threshold concept in your discipline, it's important to think about that process for learning then. Is there a sequence? You have to learn to add before you subtract, or do you have to learn to subtract before you add? Does it matter? Um, at my women and gender studies, when I'm thinking about gender and gender in the media, what do they need to know before that to be able to understand what that means? Um, when I teach WGS classes, women and gender studies classes, if I'm going to talk about racism, students need to understand privilege first before they can understand what racism is or what oppression is. So I have to think about what they need to know and understand in that, in that possibility of sequence. We talked a little bit about reflecting on your learning and then also observing your students approaching threshold concepts in your own courses. If you're starting to think about this and you're going to make some small little tweaks and changes, again, drawing from Dr. Villanova's suggestions this morning, observing where students begin to struggle, where their questions are. You can start to watch that process and then are there just in time teaching opportunities to make shifts and changes in the moment to ensure that they're being able to make the appropriate steps in learning the concept. And then how can the different ways of knowing and learning of your students impact the way you design and deliver content? This can be as deep and in-depth as you want to go, but one of the things that I think is important is to think about our student demographics. Who are our students? Who are our students generally in our classes? This is making some generalizations, but if you look and you say, you know what? 20% of my students come from the Salt Lake City School District. What, and I, you teach calculus. What calculus curriculum does that school district use? That might give you an idea and a clue into their learning pattern or what they had learned from that space. That doesn't take into account, you know, individual identities, um, home life, you know, socioeconomic status, all of those kinds of things that are also important that you work with on an individual basis, but it might give you a little bit of a baseline to give in, uh, some understanding of where your students might be coming from with some of their more systematic knowledge. And then what kind of changes can you make in your curriculum to diversify the, the avenues to mastery? So are there multiple ways of delivering content and information? Um, and are there different perspectives that you can bring in? And maybe you know you're really good at describing and identifying a particular perspective. Do you know anyone that you might be able to zoom in to deliver uh, a, a, a talk about a content. This is where we can also bring in different other types of media, TED Talks and in and, and other ways. This is like how we then begin to diversify the different types of information that come in for our students. So I want to give a little bit of time to do a little reflecting and sharing. And I see we have 58 folks and I'm now in the panic mode of then do I where my breakout rooms went in this display. So hang on just a second and let me see if I can find them. But what I want you to think about is take two minutes as I figure out the breakout rooms and think about these questions on your own. And then I'm, I'm going to hopefully, if all goes well, zoom you away into uh, random breakout rooms to kind of have these conversations. And you might be in a room with someone who teaches in your same discipline. You probably won't be. That's okay, but I want you to use the opportunity to talk to other educators about how you might identify concepts. What do you do when you find them? And how you might use this to create more inclusive learning in these little small spaces. So take a couple minutes to jot down some notes 
and think about uh, these questions. And I am going to, there. So you'll have about four to five folks. So I'm letting you think. And in a minute, I'm going to whoosh you all away. There we go. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I recognize much like the 45 minutes, 10 minutes is not enough time to begin digging into your curriculum and figuring out where these troublesome spots are. But what I would love to do is, basically, is give um, you all the floor to ask questions, to share some insights from your conversation. You can do that in the chat if you'd like, but you also, I invite you to, I'm not going to call on raised hands and things like that because with 40 folks, it's a lot, but we will just recognize that we might talk over one another on accident a little bit, but um, we'll be good about it. So if you want to voice and share or in the chat are both good spaces so we can hear about thoughts. I'll jump in here, Robin. Our group had a really good conversation and it was interesting that um, it was once you start thinking about it, it's easy to identify these threshold concepts, and it's and it's interesting. We had nurses, we had band teachers, and 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 uh, different folks, but we we all had good ideas of how to tackle these things already. We it, it's just it's nice to identify that right and be uh, ex explicit about hey, this is a threshold concept and and this is how i've handled it but then hearing how other people tackled their own threshold concepts it was it was it's like oh maybe maybe i could try something like that in my field and statistics we deal with misconceptions that are that are threshold concepts because you're trying to teach them the the actual concept and and undo the misconceptions that they've come into class with and 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 it's interesting how how you have to tackle those things, but it, it was a great discussion that we had, and I, it, it, it's meaningful to me to think about where, why I, I've known them before. I just didn't know what to call them, right? And it's, mm -hmm. like, it's a really hard concept, but uh, that that's been valuable to me today. So good, thank you, Tad. Um, I think going back to our inclusive faculty framework that I shared at the very beginning, the strategies we might utilize to to help teach and learn about a concept are, can be transferable across disciplines. And sometimes that's a hard nut to crack for folks within their discipline because you might be, well, this is the way I do it and the way we do it, and therefore it's very different than other folks. But that's not necessarily the case when we talk about strategies for teaching and learning and being inclusive. I'm going to point out that Melanie also um, in the chat has, um, they talked about celebrating those who have crossed the thresholds to help motivating those who are struggling. Celebration is absolutely, I think, critical in that you've made it through, but also recognizing that ensuring that that motivation is done, I think, in the right way, but absolutely. And then Sean's sharing about it from aviation showing the money. Yep. Good. How about anyone else want to share? Silent moments in a presentation. I'm doing it again. There you go. Um, one example in uh, natural resources, the curriculum committee met and we were talking about um, how in a bunch of junior and senior level courses, um, they were using R to demonstrate ecological models. Um, and many of the students had zero exposure to R, which is a basic programming language that's um, become, quickly become um, kind of the main, uh, way we analyze data in ecology. So, so in the kind of basic techniques class that I teach, I developed some of those modules. Um, and I, the very first year I taught it, students loved it. 
Well, it was a mixed bag. Most students loved it. Um, but I think a big part of that was explaining to them opening Excel, opening some of these other programs that they were familiar with, and having them work through a problem, clicking and dragging, and doing this kind of tedious way that they learn, um, and then doing it in R, and showing them that you can scale things up, and, and that explaining that investing the time to learn this new tool, as tortuous and unintuitive as it is, ultimately will save you time in the in the end. Great, thank you, Eric. They they like that. <laughs> yeah, I think what Eric is touching on is a component of threshold concepts. It's called the tr troublesome knowledge, and Tad talked a little bit about it also. That students come in with some preconceived notions about what they're doing in our courses and how to do it, and also have maybe have learned some bad habits and. You know, some swim coach somewhere a million years ago in my life told me that it takes 10,000 times doing it the right way or a good way to unlearn whatever that bad habit was that only took you like twice to do it. And whether those numbers are right or not, the concept is true that we become lazy about doing things certain ways and we become very entrenched in, in our ways of doing things and to undo that and to also figure out that you have to push those boundaries a little bit and a couple of the things in the chat that mention that motivation and balancing that act with sort of unlearning, but not because it's bad or it's wrong. It's just that you can do it more efficiently in a different space. I mean, sometimes it's wrong, but I mean, it's really about how can we do be better at what we're doing and more efficient. And that can be a big pedagogical shift for students to, to make that, that kind of move. I know we have about three minutes left and there are some um, other really good points in the um, chat about similar to the money motivation, finding motivation for why they're learning about this. So the, the practical applications of it and they were interested at some point, they've chosen for the most part to do this. How do we get the, how do we connect them into that space? And then, yes, statistics. I probably had to unlearn so many things in statistics, but also statistics is another one of those that um, the different types of programs and there are very critical components in um, that are threshold concepts in that particular space. And they tie into, understanding social models, geography, math, research. I mean, being able to make those connections for students once they start to get those things, I think is, is a really important piece. I have mentioned about a million times now that this is scratching the surface. What I would like to do is, um, you will get these slides. Travis has assured me that you will have the slides, which means you will have the links. Um, what I've provided here are a couple of threshold concept resources. Now you're like, just a couple? The second one here, the threshold concepts undergraduate teaching, postgraduate training one, is actually a repository. It is a vast bibliography resource page of everything threshold concepts from the early papers from Meyer and Land up to current sort of critical, um, you know, critical reflections on threshold concepts as, as a tool. And it was most recently updated in March. So it's, it's a pretty up-to-date space with lots of resources about TCs, threshold concepts. We also have inclusive teaching re uh, resources here just to tie that piece in. And then just another plug for Aspire Alliance activities. Um, as an NSF grant, we try to produce everything that we do um, to, for free for faculty, staff, and administrators and institutions. We do have an inclusive faculty framework uh, professional development series that we will be hosting probably beginning in October. And there'll be once a month, an hour and a half, and it'll kind of be a series and working into a community of practice. And I will make sure that you have links for all of that. And then we have a facilitating entering mentoring uh, workshop that is available now. And sign up for our newsletter. And if you do have any questions for me, I, Travis also has my email address and I'm happy to connect on anything. And thank you again for coming to the session. Robin, you promised a link for workshops or is that, is that also in these links or is that a separate link that you'll put in the chat or? 
Um, that is at the aspirealliance.org, and it's on the very on the third slide and on the first slide also. And we have an events page that has links to these things. Well, a big thank you to Robin Parent and and this excellent uh, presentation. Scratching the surface, hopefully some of us can dive deeper. And uh, big thanks for all of you that participated and. Uh, we will see you. We have a short 15 minute break and then at 3.30 the next session starts. So have a good rest of your day and good luck with the start of the semester. <laughs>